you for coming back. But you know what? There's a lot of people that honestly, they aren't shooting for God's best. They've just accepted less. You know, I can think of so many examples in the word of God of people that took less than what God had intended for them. Matter of fact, you, you, Jesus, when he came to Jerusalem one time, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that has killed the prophets and done all of these things, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks and you wouldn't do it. Jesus came and he wanted to bless his people and they wouldn't receive it. And so because of it, in less than 40 years after his crucifixion, Jerusalem was completely destroyed by Titus, the Roman governor, and they were all carried into exile. And Jesus said, you didn't know your time. God wants to bless us. That verse I used last night, Jeremiah 29, 11, he has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us an expected end. God has great plans for us, and yet most people aren't receiving God's best. And the sad thing is, a lot of people aren't even shooting for God's best. They have come to embrace and accept mediocrity, and they aren't looking for anything good. A lot of people use God like a, an, an insurance policy. In case something bad happens, you call on God to heal you, to get you out of a bind. But in your own daily life, just leave me alone. I'm doing fine the way I am. That's one of the reasons that we have so many problems is because we don't depend upon God and make him the center of our life. So basically last night, I was just trying to encourage people that they have to shoot for God's best. As long as you are willing to settle for less, you will. But when you start shooting for God's best, that is one of the things that starts the power of God moving towards you is just you moving in that direction. None of us have obtained God's best. I still am believing for things. I don't, I've not arrived, but I've left. You got to start moving in that direction. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I am saying that we need to start shooting for God's best. And then I also emphasized how we need to receive it. You don't get God to bless you. The Bible says that we're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It's not a matter of us getting God to give us something. It's a matter of us learning how to receive and taking our authority and using it. So what I want to do today is to begin to start talking about how to receive God's best. And I want to make a statement here that is going to shock some of you. If you haven't heard me teach on this before, uh, at first blush, this is going to sound like this can't be right. But there's basically two ways of receiving from God. Now, this is an oversimplification. You could probably be, be more detailed than what I'm going to do here, but for the purpose of what I'm doing, I'm going to talk about how to receive by a miracle and how to receive from God through a blessing. And most people, especially most spirit-filled, charismatic people would rather have a miracle. We are believing God for miracles. I want, I want to explain to you that a miracle is not God's best. God doesn't want you living from miracle to miracle. And this is important because if these are two different delivery systems, which I believe they are, well, then what if you are expecting a miracle and God is wanting to provide your need through a blessing? You could miss what God is wanting to do. You know, out where Jamie and I live, we live out on dirt roads. Our driveway is so steep. There's only one company that will come up our driveway. The others just leave it down on the road. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we've had turkeys and all kinds of things left down there, and they won't come up our driveway even in the summer. You have to have a four-wheel drive to get up my drive in the summer. And so um, anyway, we have to know when we order something, whether it's coming by UPS or what else is there? FedEx or the UPS, I mean, the United Postal Service, because uh, it depends on how they deliver it. We could miss the delivery. And so you could order something and make your order perfect, but some companies don't go all the way up our driveway. And if we don't know it's coming, we have to go look in the bushes because our package might be down there in the bushes. So anyway, it's the same with God. If you order a healing and you're praying and believing for a healing, maybe God wants to supply it through a blessing and you're looking for a miracle. You need to understand that there are different ways of God meeting your need and a miracle is not God's best. 
Now that needs to be qualified to a degree because if you're in a crisis situation and you got no opportunity or no time for the blessing of God to kick into effect and take a place, you may have to have a miracle right then to survive. But ultimately, long term, God wants to bless you and meet your needs through a blessing and not through a miracle. Here's what I mean by a miracle. A miracle, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means something extraordinary, something out of the ordinary. It's, out of, it's not normal, and it is a suspension or a superseding of natural law. Now, that's what a miracle is. It's extraordinary. It's not normal. And it's a superseding or a suspension of natural law. On the contrary, a blessing cooperates with natural law and spiritual law. Now that's important, and I'm going to explain this in a lot more detail. But let me just say this, that a miracle <clears throat> is something that really God isn't disposed to do. Because when he created the heavens and the earth, he created all of this. He, he created trees, he created the grass, he created everything. He made a perfect environment. And then it says in Genesis chapter 1, I forget what verse around verse 31 or something, it says he looked at all of this and said, behold, it is good. Actually, that's a huge understatement. Man, when he created this earth, it's awesome. You know, every time I study something and see about the human body and the complexity of it and how that the body can heal itself and do all of these things, how can any person do this and not believe there's a God? David Hardesty went and got an eye exam with a doctor and they take these pictures and he's able to see on a screen what the inside of his eye looks like. And he just said to this doctor, how can a person see this and not recognize that a God created us? And this doctor said, he agreed a hundred percent. Man, the more you study things, the complexity of it, the way that God put things together and how everything is interrelated, it's just absolutely amazing. And, you know, just here's a little P.S. Don't forget where I'm going. <laughs> but when you see the world the way that God created it, and then you think that it's so fragile that our cars could put the world out of balance and we're going to have global warming and we're going to destroy the earth. It's a person that doesn't understand that God created this earth. He said how it's going to end. He's going to destroy it in a great heat. It's not going to be destroyed by global warming or CO2 emissions, especially like this week. Hasn't it been a real testimony to global warming? I tell you what, if you believe in that stuff, I got a bridge I'd like to sell you. Amen. Anyway. I know some of you don't agree with that, but you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you. We'd both be wrong. Praise God. <laughs> but I'm just saying God created this world and everything is so perfect. And to think that we're so fragile that we're going to destroy this huge earth that God created. It's a height of arrogance. It's people that don't realize that there's a God who's in control and has done things beyond your ability. Little man's puny ability isn't going to affect any of this stuff. They've actually shown that some of the heat and things like that are associated with solar flares on the sun. Now, let me ask you how our CO2 emissions have affected the solar flares on the sun. Just silly. So anyway, God looked at everything and said, it's good. He created this world and honestly, he made it so that you don't have to have miracles. He made this world that you, if you cooperate with the laws, you know, God made all of these things for our own good. And so a miracle is a superseding or a suspension of natural laws. And God created this earth good. It is not his desire to just violate all of the things that he created. He wants you to learn to live within it. But now that we live in a corrupted world and there are things like animals were originally herbivores, is that the way you say it, where they all ate plants and things like this. But since the fall, animals have started eating each other. We see that the creation has gone out of whack. There are, I'm sure, viruses and germs existed because God created everything, but they were like animals. It used to be herbivores. Now they do something different. These viruses, these germs, these bacteria, they used to have a positive function, but 
through the fall, all of that stuff has been corrupted. So now we live in a corrupted world. There are evil things going on. And because we live in a fallen world and there are problems, there are needs for miracles where God supersedes or suspends natural laws to be able to minister to people and to keep his kingdom going. And so I agree that that does happen. But here's, here's some points I want you to consider. Here's three points about miracles contrasted with three points about blessings. And I'll go back and explain this in more detail. But if you could get this, it'll change your impression. A miracle is a superseding or a suspension of natural laws. And God created these natural laws, so he's not prone to do it. So before God will give you a miracle, you have to be in a crisis. So if you're going to live from miracle to miracle, you're going to live from crisis to crisis. That's not what you want. And yet there's a lot of people that they ignore the natural laws. They ignore not only natural, but spiritual laws. Like for instance, when we talk about health, people will always talk about your diet and exercise. And you know what? Those are some natural laws. If you don't use muscles, they atrophy. And so there is a truth here. But again, the secular world doesn't even acknowledge that there is a spiritual being. They just look at everything carnally and try and figure things out. They believe that we're nothing but evolved animals. They believe in evolution. They don't believe in the spiritual part of man. And so if you listen to our world system today, they'll tell you that it's all diet and exercise. They'll go over to Japan where people have the lowest... Um, degree of heart problems in the world and they have long lives and they'll look at that and they'll just immediately examine some natural things such as their diet and they say they eat a lot of fish and so that must be the key to long life and, and low health risk is by eating a lot of fish. And what they miss is that the Bible says that if you honor your father and mother, you will live long upon the land. And Japanese actually worship ancestors. You talk about honoring. That's an important part. And yet, see, you aren't ever going to have any scientists look at any spiritual, emotional application of anything. They're just trying to find a carnal reason because they aren't spiritual. They don't think spiritually minded. And so they ignore this. But I tell you, honoring your parents is a big part of whether or not you're healthy or not. Amen, Amen or oh me. Amen. Some of you that grew up in the 60s and gave your parents fits, you've never made a connection, but I guarantee you there is a connection between the way you've honored your parents and some of the things that are happening in your physical body. The scripture also says in Proverbs, I think it's 17, that a merry heart does good like a medicine. And you know what? If you rejoice and if you're a happy person, it affects your physical body. There's a reason that Bob Hope and Milton Berle and George Burns lived over a hundred and yet they drank and they smoked and they did all of these things that our world is saying is wrong and yet they lived to be over a hundred because you know what? They were comedians and they did a lot of laughing and they learned how to laugh. I don't know exactly what proportion the spiritual has over the physical, but I'm saying that if you listen to the natural world, they'll say 100% of your health is diet and exercise. It's not. This is andiology. I have no way of verifying it, but I believe it's 20%. And what you, how you honor other people, the respect you show to people, whether you honor God, whether you have joy in your heart and are walking in the joy of the Lord is probably 80%, 50% of your health. And people don't even ignore any of that stuff. And this is the reason that you can have people like my mother who basically, uh, she didn't like vegetables. She didn't, she wasn't a health nut and she lived to be 96 and was healthy up until the time she was at least 92, 93. And you know why? Because she was adopted at birth, never knew who her real parents were. And she honored her adoptive parents and loved them and spoke well of them, even though they got a divorce when she was a little kid, which back in those days, that was a real stigma. And my mother still honored her mother and she lived, my grandmother lived and raised me until I was about eight years old. That's when she died. And uh, you know what? My mother honored her parents, and she was a happy woman, even though she had a lot of things happen to her. And because of it, she lived to be 
96 and was healthy and all of these things contrary to all the reports because uh, those things are important. So anyway, I got off on that by saying that, see, a miracle, you have to have a crisis to have it. And people don't observe these spiritual laws, such as honoring your parents, such as operating in the joy of the Lord, such as casting your care over on the Lord, and you are stressed out, and you're worried, and you're a type A personality, and you've got all of these things that we've just embraced that are contrary to what the Word of God teaches, and because of it, we have health issues, and then you go to God, and you believe, and you get a miracle but it's not going to come until you're in a crisis. And then once that miracle comes, it's only going to be temporary. That's the second characteristic of a miracle. Miracles are always temporary. Whereas once a blessing, once you tap into the blessing of God, it cannot be reversed. It's eternal. I'm going to show you these things from scripture. I'm just summarizing it at first, but a miracle has to have a crisis. Whereas a blessing will prevent crisis. A miracle is only temporary, whereas once you get the blessing flowing, it cannot be stopped. It is awesome. It is much better. And a miracle is never abundant. It's only enough to get you by. It is not going to be abundance, whereas a blessing is so abundant, you won't even have room enough to receive it. God can meet your needs miraculously, but there's a better way. He would rather you start walking in the blessing of God. My wife and I are an example of this, and basically it was me that caused the problem. When I first got started in ministry, I had this idea that if I was called to ministry, I was sinning against God if I worked a job. I was called to minister, so I had to minister and trust God. That's not right. I'm not criticizing anybody else. I don't know why I got it. I just... I just thought that. I thought I would be, I wouldn't be faithful to what God told me to do if I worked a job. And so when we first got started in ministry, we were ministering to about five or six people a week. And you know what? When you're ministering to five or six people a week, you shouldn't be able to live full time of the ministry. But I had made a decision. I quit my job and Jamie and I nearly starved to death. And we went through extreme poverty for two years and probably for the first 10 years of our life, we could have qualified for welfare. Our total income the first uh, 12 months of our marriage was $1,253. And we had $100 a month rent. Go figure that out. And then our second year, it went up to $2,500. When we moved to Manitou Springs, Colorado Springs area in 1980, we had been in ministry by that time for what, 12 years or something like that. And uh, our budget was um, $700 a month is what we were believing God for. To run the ministry, I was on radio and that was our personal income. And we struggled, 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 struggled because of my own stupidity because I wouldn't go work. But you know what? My heart was right. My head was wrong, but my heart was right. And so because of it, we had miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, we prayed and God just supernaturally multiplied food for us. We ran out of gas and we were in Dallas in really cold weather with a baby that was just real small, about one year old. And we ran out of gas on right downtown at, at I-30 and I-45. And we were there late at night and it was cold. We would have frozen to death. We didn't have anywhere to go. This is before you had cell phones. And so, you know what? We just laid hands on that car and prayed over it. And it started after it had run out of gas. And we drove it for a week until I got enough money to put some gas in. We were going to... We uh, had our, I didn't have enough money to put antifreeze in the car. And so the block broke. You could see the crack and the water ran out of the block. And you know, I drove that car for over a year with a cracked block that the water poured out and I laid hands on it and just prayed and God kept it going. We saw miracle after miracle happen. We saw food multiply. We saw so many miracles. And I remember 
when we were getting ready to build our house, I was driving out one morning to feed my horses and I was praying and saying, God, I haven't seen miracles. I was just reminiscing about how God used to just, I mean, we would get money in the mail with no address on a return envelope and a, you know, $500 cash in an envelope. And it would just come. And it was miraculous, the things that I, I could tell you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories. And I was reminiscing about this. And as I was driving out to our property, I was thinking, God, I hadn't seen miracles happen in our life in a decade or two decades. And I was kind of feeling like, what's wrong with me? I used to have to have a miracle every day to survive. And I was praying, God, is there something wrong? Am I missing something? And he spoke to me and he says, would you like to go back to those days to where you had to have a miracle to be able to eat? And I said, no, sir, I wouldn't. Thank you. <laughs> And I began to realize that, you know what, finally I began to learn some things. And when I got so full time in the ministry that now I couldn't work a job and do what God has opened up the door. When you become full time in the ministry, then you can live full time of it. And see, now I'm cooperating with spiritual laws. It says over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 11 or somewhere around there. If you don't work, don't eat. I was violating some spiritual laws and it wasn't because I didn't like work. I've always been a hard worker. I just thought that to serve God, I couldn't serve God and work a secular job. And because of it, I was violating some spiritual laws and I had to have a miracle, but I lived from crisis to crisis. Every month we were on the verge of total disaster. Now I've learned some things and you know what? We are blessed and we've got our house paid for, all of our cars paid for. We owe no man anything and God has blessed us and I've tapped into the blessing and the blessing is permanent. The blessing is more abundant. It prevents crisis. Whereas when I was living from miracle to miracle every month, we had to have a new miracle in order to pay our bills, in order to eat. You know, if you're listening I could be answering questions for some of you that you're wondering why it seems like you're always on the verge of having a crisis and something's happening. It's because you aren't cooperating with either spiritual or natural law. There's a reason. And for you to operate in the blessing of God, you're going to have to start conforming to these things to see the blessing of God come. Otherwise, God loves you. And if you get into a crisis situation, he will provide you with a miracle. But a miracle is never as abundant. You have to have a crisis first. Then it's only temporary. God is not going to let you live uh, long term by miracles. And you are going to have to eventually step over into the blessings of God to have things consistent in your life. Turn over to, um, let's see, is it Numbers, chapters, um, well, I just had a blank. Maybe it's Exodus, chapter 13. Let's look over here, see if I can find where the manna came. <clears throat> I think this is what, Exodus, chapter 13, does anybody know? Exodus 13 is where the manna first came. No, nope, couldn't be Exodus 13. That's where they came out of. Anyway, Exodus 16. So in Exodus chapter 16 is where the manna came. And the reason I'm bringing this out is because this is an absolute miracle. Every morning, there would be just this manna appear. And I've had some people try and explain this. You know, there's a lot of people that just will not believe that miracles take place. They try and explain everything naturally. And I've actually read commentaries where they believe this was the secretion of some beetle. I don't believe this was a secretion of some beetle. For one thing, it came six days a week. And then on the seventh day, it wasn't there. Do those beetles not secrete anything on the seventh day? <laughs> and if you gathered more than the prescribed amount, it would rot and breed worms. But on the sixth day, there would be twice as much manna as there was any other day. They would gather it and it would keep until the next day. It was a miracle. 
Amen. I don't know. You know, it's amazing how people try and get around things. I actually was in a place one time where they were trying to say that Moses crossed the Reed Sea instead of the Red Sea. And the water was only three feet, three inches deep. And so it wasn't, you know, really a miracle for the water to part. It was just a minor thing. Maybe the wind blew and just, you know, a ripple or something allowed them to go through. And basically, they just argued and argued with me. And finally, I said, well, praise God, this is a greater miracle than I thought for all of those Egyptians and their horses to dry, drown in three inches of water. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? It was a miracle. God does miracles. Miracles do happen. And the, and the manna was an absolute miracle. It, as a matter of fact, it says over, I think it's Psalms 106, that man did eat angels' food. I don't know if that was maybe symbolic or metaphor, but it's possible that this was actually angels' food. It certainly was nutritious because it's all they had for 40 years. And they ate this manna. So it was an absolute miracle, but they were in crisis first. They were running out of food. There was no way that they were going to live in the wilderness, in the desert, by planting crops. They could have killed off all of their animals and have eaten them, and they couldn't have sustained themselves for 40 years. They were in a crisis situation, and only in a crisis situation will God suspend natural laws and do something that is supernatural. And so there was a miracle of this angel's food coming, and the children of Israel ate it. But... It was temporary. And this is the longest miracle recorded in Scripture. Like when Moses walked, I mean, when uh, Jesus walked on top of the water, did you know that that was just temporary? He didn't walk on water another time. When Peter walked on the water to go to him, it was very temporary. He never did it again. It was a superseding or a suspension of natural laws for a brief period of time. But Jesus never did it again. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, he broke it. They took up 12 baskets full of fragments after over 5,000 men, not including women and children, probably 10, 15,000 people ate and were full. They had more left over than when they started. But if you would have gotten one of those pieces of bread that Jesus had broken off after he fed the people, and if you'd have started breaking it, it wouldn't have multiplied. It wasn't a permanent deal. It was temporary. It meant that one situation, and it was over. Miracles are temporary, whereas I'll show you some scriptures that once a blessing is given, it cannot be reversed. You cannot stop it. Once you tap into the blessing of God, nothing can stop it. Well, that's a major difference right there. Amen. So this is the longest miracle recorded in the Word. But look over in Joshua chapter 5, and I'll show you the end of this miracle. In Joshua chapter 5, this is as they entered the promised land. And in verse 19, Joshua 5, 19, it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. The manna ceased. This was a 40 year miracle, which was very exceptional. Every other miracle that I can see in the word, it was just really brief. But this is a 40 year miracle, but it came to an end. And did you know that there isn't manna anymore? That was a superseding a suspension of natural laws. It was something miraculous that happened, but it came to the end. And did you know that every person that entered into the promised land, the Lord in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers sent out spies into the promised land and they came back and they said, oh, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 23, it talks about that they got one cluster of grapes. And it was so big, they had to put it on a pole in between two men to carry it. You know, we don't even understand, but back before judgment came upon the nation of Israel, it says it was like the Garden of Eden. 
One cluster of grapes was so big that two men had to carry it. Could you imagine two men carrying one of our clusters of grapes? <laughs> this thing was huge. The land was awesome. It was green. It was like the Garden of Eden. It was well watered. It was an awesome place. And they entered into their promised land and they started eating the old corn of the land, the fruit that grew out of the ground. And you know what? It was more abundant than the manna. Matter of fact, it says that the children of Israel got to where they loathed that manna. They hated it. Did you know if you ate the same thing morning, noon, and night for 40 years, you would hate it? I don't care if it was your favorite dish, if it was a steak, if you had to eat steak three meals a day for 40 years, you'd throw that steak in the ground to go get a hot dog if somebody offered you one. People like variety, but you know what? They, they got tired of the manna, and yet it says some of the people went out to gather the manna after it had ceased, and it wasn't there. You know, it's amazing. I, I, just believe, I could bet my life on this because I deal with people, that many of those people had grown up never eating anything but manna in their entire life. It says that all of the people who were 20 years old and died, 20 years old and above died in the wilderness. So that means that the only people who were still alive before the manna started coming were people who were less than 20 years old. But for 40 years, they had eaten nothing but manna. So that means for two thirds of their life, they had never eaten anything but manna. And the majority of the people who went into the promised land were people who had never eaten anything but manna. They had never planted a crop. They had never weeded anything out. They had never put fertilizer on anything. They had never grown a thing in their life. They had lived by a miracle every day of their life for 40 years. And I can just guarantee you when Moses, uh, when uh, Joshua said that tomorrow we'll eat the, the good of the land, some of those people went out the next morning to see where their manna was. They had gotten manna every day for 40 years and they went out and I can just hear some of them saying, man, not me. I'm not going to dig in the ground and eat something that grows out of the ground. I'm not going to have to work. I'm not going to sweat. You aren't going to make me have to work. I'm a full gospel person. God just supplies my needs supernaturally and I'm going to go out and I'm going to continue to believe God for a miracle. Well, there was a period of time he met their needs by a miracle, but it came to an end. It was only during a crisis situation. It was only temporary. And if a person would have said, man, I'm just believing for God to supernaturally meet my needs, they'd have starved to death. Come on, come on. And you know what? There are people today that have prayed and because God loves you in a crisis situation, miracles happen. Like I've actually heard stories before about a woman who was starving to death and she prayed and believed God and a dog drug a bag of groceries up and dumped it on her front door and didn't eat any of it and just left it. And there was steak and there was all kinds of things there. You know what? That's a miracle that a dog would not eat it and drag it up and put it on your doorstep. And that's a miracle. But if that's the way you're going to live and if you're going to have God supply a miracle, you're going to go from crisis to crisis to crisis and it will come to an end. Eventually, God wants you to get out there and figure out how to take this power to get wealth and start using it and be productive. And yet there are probably people in this room who are praying and just asking God to give you a miracle. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessing of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it says, He will bless whatever you set your hand unto. A hundred times zero is zero. And there are probably people right here in this room that are doing absolutely nothing for God to bless but you are believing God for a miracle to supply your need and you're wanting... This is what leads people to play the lottery. You know, this is just my opinion. I know some of you are going to take offense at this, but it's just the way I feel that only losers play the lottery. 
Statistics show that over 80% of all lottery buyers are in the poverty level. People who know how to make money do not spend money on a lottery ticket. That's just stupid. So, oh, so-and-so won $52 million. Yeah, one out of 450,000 people wins. Man, I got a sure thing. Put your money in the gospel and you'll get a hundredfold return on every penny you put into the gospel. You can count on that. A blessing can be counted on. You can't count on a miracle. You can't control a miracle. There isn't a handle on a miracle. You just get in a crisis situation and you believe God and praise God, maybe you'll get a miracle. But you know what? You can start walking in the blessings of God and you can make the blessings of God manifest. That's powerful. And yet there's people that are out there and they're doing nothing. They're buying a lottery ticket thinking that that's how God's going to get the money to you. The Bible talks, I'm not going to turn over and read all these, but it says wealth gotten by vanity takes away the life of the owners thereof. Somebody's going to win the lottery, but it's not God that's going to rig it and make you win it. That would be dishonest. If God was a person, he'd be put in prison. God's not going to fix the lottery for you. God's not going to help you to just somehow or another win. God is not going to pr promote you to the CEO if you're a couch potato and if you don't do a good job. And if you aren't serving your company well, you, aren't, it, you can't believe God for a miracle and he just leapfrogs you to the top of the ladder and gives you all of this success. There are some people who are believing God to just supply your needs supernaturally. You're like the people that want to go out and receive manna. And there may have been a time where God has done a miracle for you, but it's in a crisis situation. It's temporary. This is not the way that God wants you to live from miracle to miracle. He wants you to learn how to start being productive. Set your hands unto something and believe God to bless it. I'm not against people that are on welfare. Anybody could be in trouble and need help temporarily, but I am against people that are on welfare for 10 years, 20 years, second and third generation. And there's people who said, but if I went and got a job at McDonald's, I'd make less than I do off of welfare. But you would be putting your hand to something and God can bless that. God can't bless welfare. You aren't going to have God supernaturally bless welfare. It is an ungodly system to get something for nothing. Thank you for that thunderous silence. If they'd make me dictator for a week, I can solve a lot of problems. You know, they're trying to cut a hundred billion dollars out of the budget. And they're struggling and stuff. Did you know you could cut nearly $1 trillion out of the budget immediately by quit paying welfare payments to all illegal aliens? $1 trillion. Make me president for a day and I'd solve a lot of things. I'd probably be killed before the day was out, but... You know what? We, we just got systems in place that are ungodly. God doesn't want you to be getting something for nothing. God, for you to just sit here and pray and believe that God's going to supply your need, you are believing for a miracle that if you get it, you are going to be in a crisis situation before it comes. It, you're going to be right on the verge of disaster before you get it. It's not going to happen any other way. He's not quick to hand out miracles because he'd rather you start just learning the laws, natural and spiritual laws to work. And God will bless what you set your hand unto and start doing things. And the, he wants to supply your need through a blessing, not through a miracle. Amen. So some of those people got up and went out looking for manna and it ceased. And they, if they hadn't have just eventually come around to, well, you know what? I guess I'm going to have to dig in the ground. I guess I'm going to have to plant a seed. I'm going to have to cooperate with the laws that God made. I'm going to have to work if I want to eat. If they didn't adopt that and if they just sat there waiting on the manna, they starved to death because it was over. God does not want to meet your needs only by miracles. You know, in the, in the physical realm, there are people that sit here and you treat your body wrong. 
you never eat, you never exercise, you aren't honoring your parents, you don't have joy, you are depressed and discouraged, which uh, people today think, well, I have no control over that. You have absolute control over it. If you're depressed, you chose to be depressed. I can feel the darts coming my way right now, but it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And anyway, there's people that, well, I just can't help it. And you're sitting here and you've got depression going. You've got inactivity, bad food. You're overweight, which I'm not condemning anybody who's overweight. I'm overweight. A little bit of sin is not better than a lot of sin. I'm not mad at myself. I'm not mad at you. But I'm saying you are violating natural laws. And then when something goes wrong, you just pray for a miracle. That's not how God wants to do it. You know, I carry feed, uh, feed sacks all of the time, and, I, and they're like 50 pounds a piece. If I was 100 pounds overweight, that's like putting two feed sacks strapped to my middle. And if I could tie two feed sacks to my middle, and if I carried two feed sacks around, and then when I slept, I had these feed sacks on top of me, and every time I rolled over, I had to flip over and you know what? I'd probably have back problems. And if you came up to me for prayer and if you had two feed sacks strapped around you, I'd pray for a miracle, but you know what I'd do? I'd say, take those sacks off and it'll help. <laughs> I'd cut the sacks off and then I'd pray for you and ask God for mercy and start you with the miracle and from now on, I'm gonna do it right. But people ignore this and then they just are so put out about why isn't God healing me? God has blessed you, but there are some natural laws that you have to cooperate with to be able to walk in the blessings of God. You got to take care of yourself. And if you're one that's just going to, you're going to believe God for a healing and yet you're a hundred pounds overweight and you aren't going to have any heart problems and you aren't going to have any high blood pressure problems and you aren't going to have any joint problems. Well, then you're going to be a person who lives from miracle to miracle and you're going to have crisis and you're going to have a lot of problems before you see that miracle come to pass. Thank you, Pastor Bobby Ray. I know people don't care to hear this, but it's the truth. I tell you, there's some things that we have to do to cooperate with the things of God. It's not earning God's healing power or anything like that. It's just that there are natural laws. There are things that you do. If you want a crop to grow, you can't just pray over the ground. I actually had one guy in my Bible study who got born again, was so turned on to the Lord that he was on the full gospel businessman circuit teaching, and he didn't have time to plant his wheat crop. And out in Southern Colorado, they count their acreage in sections. They don't count acres, they count sections. He had 25 sections of land, 640 acres per section. He waited until one week before the weed harvest. Everybody else's wheat was already up and beginning to turn. And since he had been out, preaching the gospel, he just figured God would take care of him. And he went and borrowed half a million dollars worth of wheat seed and planted it all one week before a harvest and expected a miracle. And guess what? He lost it all. His wheat didn't come up and he was half a million dollars in debt. And people think, well, you can't do that. This is what people do all the time in the natural realm. They sow to their flesh they give Satan an inroad at them. And then when, when the train wreck happens, God, I'm believing you for a miracle. That's not how it works. There are some things you need to learn to cooperate with. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about all the physical things because we have, that's all that the world talks about. But there are spiritual laws about sowing and reaping. For instance, giving is a part of your, your prosperity. The Lord says, honor the Lord. The Bible says, honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine. Proverbs chapter 11. Amen. And if you aren't giving, then you can say what you want to, but you aren't honoring the Lord. Amen. Oh, well, I honor the Lord, but I just don't have anything left. 
If you really honored the Lord, if you believed his promise, Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. If you really believe that, you would honor him by doing that if you had to quit eating to pay your tithes and to give. And some people are like, oh, no, that's not right. Yeah, it is right. You know, if, if I had the resources, I don't have the resources, I'm still growing. But if I had the resources to guarantee that any person who gives me a hundred dollars, I'll give you back $10,000. That's a hundred fold return. And if I promised you that, and if I had the resources to do it, you would be foolish not to give. If it was going to produce a hundred fold return. Even if you didn't have it, you'd poke your neighbor and say, give me a hundred dollars and I'll pay you back two and you would be 9,908, uh, no, what would that be? 98, anyway, it'd be, you'd be a lot better off. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> $9,800 better off. And you know what? If you really believe me, you would borrow it if you had to, to give, because you're going to get a hundredfold return. When the Lord says that there is no person in, Matthew, in uh, Mark chapter 10, somewhere around verse 30 or something, it says, there is no man that hath left house or lands or father or mother or brother or sister for my sake, but what he shall receive a hundredfold in this life. In this life, not just in the one to come, but in this life. That's the promise of God. If that's true, which it is, then you know the only reason a person wouldn't give it's because they really don't believe. They don't honor what God says. They are leaning onto their own understanding. They're saying, I need this money. This is mine. Instead of honoring God. That's a spiritual law. And you aren't going to prosper. You aren't going to get the blessing of God. You might win the lottery. You might be the one out of 450 million people who won the lottery, but you aren't going to have the blessing of God flowing in your life unless you start cooperating with the spiritual laws that govern prosperity, which is give and it shall be given unto you. Honor the Lord and it'll be poured out. You have to start cooperating with this and get involved in the laws of God to be able to see this blessing flow. And if you don't do that, you're going to be one of those that sits there. And when a crisis hits, you pray and, oh, God, don't you love me? And sure, he loves you. And if it gets bad enough, right before you're drug away to the poorhouse, right before your house is repossessed, after you've spent two months being awake, struggling with all of these things and worrying and obsessing, then you'll get a miracle at the midnight hour and God will pull you through. And you'll wonder, why does it seem like I'm always living from crisis to crisis? Because you're trying to receive miracles from God instead of getting involved in the blessing and starting flowing in the blessing. That is the gospel truth. <laughs> if you want to receive God's best, you're going to have to start learning that a miracle isn't his best. Now, if you're in a situation where you, you know, have had something happen, say, for instance, you're dying and the doctor says you only have a week to live, a miracle may be best for you right now. That's right. And so you have to have a miracle to get over it. But then don't go back to doing the things that allowed the devil to put the cancer there in the first place. Don't go back to worrying and obsessing. Don't go back to being depressed and discouraged. Don't go back to being rebellious and mean and ornery. Go to honoring people and doing things. Go back to letting your heart be merry. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Get involved in the blessings of God. Start flowing in the things of God so that you can prevent it. But there's a lot of people that they just go and they let a doctor cut out the cancer, cut out parts of their body. They live without things and then it comes back and they go get something else cut back. You only got so many parts, amen. Eventually, they gonna, you know, you're going to run out of things that they can throw away. There's a better way. And there's not a lot of people that have tapped into the blessings of God. They're just living from crisis to crisis. It's always temporary. 
and it's not as abundant. When they got the old corn of the land, who wouldn't have rather had grapes that are so big that you have to carry one cluster on a pole between two men? Man, crops that are growing and the land was like the Garden of Eden. Anything would grow. Who wouldn't rather have that abundance than a little tiny wafer that evaporated by noon every day and was gone? A blessing will get you by, but it'll never be abundant. But in the promised land, there was such an abundance, but it took labor. They had to cooperate with the seasons. They had to plant at a certain time. They had to weed their gardens. They had to keep the animals out. There was things that they had to do. And you know what? There's a lot of people that rather than accept this responsibility, would rather just sit there and with their feet propped up, watching as the stomach turned on television. And when they get in trouble, oh God, I'm believing you for a miracle. It takes effort to cooperate in the blessings. It takes effort to get in there and learn the spiritual laws and do the things that you've got to do to see the blessing of God work in your life. Amen or oh me. Well, that's powerful. And I tell you, there's a lot more that I've got to share on this, but I'm about out of time here today. But if you could just get this concept that miracles, sometimes there needs to be a combination of the two. Sometimes we find ourselves in such bad situation that we need a miracle from God to even get back up to ground level and get started. And so if you need a miracle, praise God, receive one, pray for one and get one. But ultimately get to a place to where God, I pray that I never have to have another miracle in my life. I pray that I never have to get there. I'm praying that, man, all of the miracles will be for other people. Jesus used miracles like a bell that drew people to him because they had so many needs and he meant their needs. But then he told them, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. And he told them to quit doing the things that they'd been doing, to start seeking God. And you may be in a situation where you need a miracle right now, but don't live there. Get to a place to where you start walking in the blessings of God and say, God, I want to walk in your abundance. I'd rather have the abundance of the promised land than the miracle manna of the, of the desert, of the wilderness. And there's a lot of people that have just been praying and waiting on God to supply a miracle because you haven't been cooperating with the laws of God. You know, when you start understanding a blessing, and tonight I'm going to really get into some things that will help you to start understanding how to receive this. But it's like you got this huge river, like the Mississippi River or some huge river flowing by right out there and beside you. And all you got to do is just start drawing a little line over to yourself and divert a little bit of that water. And then it starts running and it starts washing out. And you know, if you dug a deep enough channel, you could actually divert the course of that entire river towards you. In a sense, here's all of the blessings of God that are abundant. God wants you healthy, wealthy, prosperous, joyful, anointed, on and on and on. The abundance of God is just awesome. But you got to start it flowing towards you by saying, all right, I will confess the word of God. I will honor you and I am going to give a portion of what I've got. And I am, and you start doing that and you start this flow of the blessing towards you. It'll come as a little trickle and then a little increase and increase. And you can get literally to where it just overwhelms you. The blessing of God comes upon you and overtakes you. Most people are seeking the blessings of God. The scripture says that the blessings will come upon you and overtake you. That means you can't outrun them. You get to a place where you just can't help it. Every time you turn around, you're blessed. You know, we got some things working. I hadn't got the privilege of telling you what they are right now, but they're awesome. And I was just talking to David Hardesty two weeks ago and said, man, well, I'm ready to do this now. We just need a person. And then Jamie and I, one week later, we're talking to a guy and all of a sudden, I think I'm supposed to do this. And Jamie and I drove home like, can you believe that we're just so blessed. We hardly even mention anything until boom, here's a person that God raises up and a person that I wouldn't have even thought would have been available to help me do what I need to do because they're just overqualified and I'm just blessed. God just 
brings blessings to me. I'm a blessing magnet. I can't turn around without being blessed. You can reach a place to where you just are so blessed. It's like, God, what else can you do? What, how else could you bless me? How, how better could it be? There's some of you aren't relating to what I'm saying because you've never flowed into the blessing. But I'm telling you that God has more for you than what any of us are receiving. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. Before you can be a blessing to other people, you yourself have to be blessed. If you're one that's living from crisis to crisis and you're just constantly struggling, you can't be a blessing to other people. You're struggling yourself. The Lord told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse two and three, he says, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Before Abraham could be a blessing, he had to be blessed. He had to receive it. And man, I wish I had time. I probably won't have time to go through Abraham, but what a great example of blessing. This man began to prosper so much that literally two different kings came out and said, you're mightier than we are. Depart from us because we cannot, our land cannot sustain your prosperity and our whole nation. He was more prosperous than the entire nation. The whole nation. Amen. And it was because of the blessing of God. And once he understood that he was blessed, once he got a blessed mentality, he and his nephew Lot were so prosperous that they couldn't graze all of their cattle and sheep together because they had too much. They were too prosperous. And so Abraham said, we're going to have to split ways. He says, you pick. He says, you either go down here where there's this great pasture land or take the desert. You pick and I'll go the opposite direction. There was no guess as to what Lot was going to pick. He was going to pick the thing that had all the well-watered pasture land. You know what that says? Abraham was so confident that he was blessed that he would come out on top that give me the worst thing and it'll, I'll still prosper. He knew that his blessing wasn't just physical. There was physical things that he did, but it wasn't his physical thing. It was, he was counting on the blessing of God. He knew God said, I am going to bless you and make your name great. And he believed it. And because of it, he was willing to let other people take the better part. You know, that would be comparable today to somebody who's a salesman and everybody's vying for position and wanting the best district so that they, their sales can go up and your commission can go up. Most of us would nearly stab a person in the back to be able to get the best district and the one that's going to do the best. But you know, a blessed person will say, it doesn't matter. Give me the worst district. Put me in the worst spot and I guarantee you I'll come out ahead. You can get that attitude. I've actually told an employer before, I said, if you hire me, you'll be blessed. Because whatever I set my hand unto is blessed. I'm prosperous. And some people think, man, you're arrogant. I'm not arrogant. That is knowing that I'm blessed. Jamie and I got into a situation where we couldn't pay our landlord. And instead of waiting three or four weeks until he came after me and threatened me the day my rent was due. I went and told this guy and I said, I don't have the money. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm good for it. I will pay you, but I just don't have it. I didn't avoid him. I was upfront and honest with him. And he owned a photography studio and he says, I'm about to lose my business. He said, the guy that developed my pictures is gone. He says, I'll let you work it off. And I couldn't, this is back during that poverty time when I thought it was wrong for me as a minister to, to work, but I couldn't sit there and say, no, I'm not going to work when I owed the guy money. And so reluctantly I said, well, okay. And I went in there and he started teaching me how to develop pictures. He had a contract from the high school and he had two eight by tens, a five by seven and 17 wallet size photos for every kid in the school and they were two months behind on fulfilling it and I had to get in and started developing these pictures. So he took me in there the very first time and he shot this, uh, we had a dark room in this machine and you had to shoot this and put it through the developer and do all of this. And old school, amen. And um, anyway, we came out and he looked at this picture and he says, what's wrong with this picture? And I said, nothing's wrong with that picture. That looks great. He says, too much magenta. I said, what's magenta? I didn't even know what magenta was. 
And he went in and started trying to teach me. And honestly, I couldn't figure it out. I, I just didn't. That's not my calling. But you know what? I, I needed to pay this guy off and I wanted to do a good job. So I got in there and I started praying in tongues. And I did things that you can't do. I did. I ain't got time to explain it, but because there were 17 wallet size, you could only put eight wallets on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And then the extra one, the 17th, had to be put on one sheet of paper and then run through the developer. And so you wasted the rest of that paper. I thought it would make sense to put eight different people's wallet size picture on that, but you had to cover it and then turn on the lights, change out the negative, redo everything, and then remember where you were on this piece of paper and stuff. And so anyway, I shot one of those and he came walking through and he came running in there and he said, you've put eight different people's picture on this and you didn't overexpose the other one. He says, I've been developing pictures for 26 years. You can't do that again if your life depended on it. He says, I've only done that once in 26 years. And I said, well, look at this. And I took him into a room and there must have been, there must have been a hundred sheets like that, that I had already done. And this guy just, he just shook his head and he says, I don't know what you're doing, but he says, keep doing it. And did you know, within two months, he offered me 50% of his business. And I told him, I said, no, I'm called a minister and I didn't take him up on it. But I say that guy's business. And you know, he heard me on television giving this story and he contacted me. He's down here somewhere in South Texas now. And uh, he wrote and asked me about, do you remember working for me? And I said, sure I do. And you know, when it came time to leave, he wanted me to train a replacement. <laughs> so they brought a guy in and I took him in the dark room and we shot a shot and I took it out into the light and I said, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> He goes, nothing draw with that. I said, too much magenta. I've been waiting to do it. <laughs> and I started teaching him how to do the sh settings and do all of this stuff. And I mean, I only had one night to train this guy and he started panic. It was about the end. He says, I still don't understand what you're doing. How do you do this? And I said, well, if you want me to be totally honest, I, I pray in tongues and I ask God to show me what this picture needs. And God just gives me words of knowledge and shows me how to do it. And this guy hit all of, you know, his face just flushed. And he says, I don't pray in tongues. What do I do? And I said, well, I can help you. I can help you to pray in tongues. Other than that, I don't know what to tell you. And I just left him. Amen. But I'm saying that, you know what? I'm blessed. And I could guarantee you if something happened, if I had to go work at McDonald's, I'd either be the manager or the owner of that McDonald's in a short period of time, because I'm blessed. And if I set my hand unto it, I'm blessed. Whatever I do is blessed. Some of you are thinking, I'd never say that, obviously. <laughs> it's obvious, because you don't understand the power of a blessing. Once you understand the blessing of God, I guarantee you this will change your life if you can understand how blessed you are and how to start receiving God's best, His blessing. It will transform your life. You'll never go back to being normal. Amen. And the good news is that every one of us has been blessed. Ephesians 1.3, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every one of you is blessed. We just haven't understood this concept of a blessing. We haven't understood how to activate it, how to get it going. And because of it, many of us have lived outside of the blessing of God, just under your own effort, your own strength. And I tell you, there's a better way. This will change your life if you can receive all of these things that we're talking about. It'll be a real blessing to you. Let me remind you again that we have last night and today's already, well, it's not already, but within five minutes, it'll be duplicated CDs and DVDs. And you need to get this and go over it and over it and over it. And it would be a real help to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we love you and we just thank you that you have blessed us. 
that, Father, you have something better for us than a miracle. Not that a miracle is bad. It's just that the blessing is so much greater. Father, thank you that you have provided for everything. You've given us all spiritual blessings, and we don't have to live from crisis to crisis. We don't have to live in temporary miracles. That, Father, we can live in the abundance of a blessing. Father, I thank you for that, and I ask through the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit would take the things I've talked about here today and that you would just open up people's hearts and that we would start pursuing your blessing. Learn how to walk in it. Learn what the blessings of God are. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we believe that you are burning this in people's hearts. And that, Father, we, I pray that we would get to a place that if we need a miracle, we receive it, but then we get to a place that we say, Father, I pray that I'll never have to have another miracle that I'll walk in the blessings of God. I'll be divinely healthy instead of learning how to get a miracle healing. That we will just be so blessed that we can do whatever it is that you call us to do without having to start praying for a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. We believe that your supply is greater than our need. And we just submit ourselves today to receive these blessings and miracles. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. You know, if you aren't born again, you need to be born again. That's the greatest miracle that any person could ever receive is the gift of eternal life. And then you need the power of the Holy Spirit because you, this is not normal the way that I'm talking. I had the man from South Africa say that, man, he was just overwhelmed last night with some of the things I said. You know what? I know that what I'm saying is not normal. But you know what? I don't want to be normal. I don't want to be like this world. We are of another country. We've been born again. And you, you're going to have to think differently. And the Holy Spirit will just transform the way you see things. You know, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. We had over 120 people last night come and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speak in tongues. That's awesome. And speaking in tongues is very important. But you know the number one thing that happened when I received the Holy Spirit? It just changed the way I saw things. It changed the way I thought. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But the Holy Spirit reveals them unto us. You need the Holy Spirit to see things from God's standpoint. If you think like the world, Proverbs 23, 7, as you think in your heart, that's the way it's going to be. You think like the world, you're going to get the world results. You need to think like God, and you cannot do that apart from the inspiration, the motivation of the Holy Spirit. So you need to receive the Holy Spirit separate from your salvation experience. You need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Is there anybody here who has not received either one or both of those and you say, I want to receive? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Here's some people right here. Anybody else? Here's others over here. Praise God. I know we had a lot of people that this was your first service like we had a lot of people receive last night. But if you haven't received this, you need it. It's absolutely essential. You don't have to have it to go to heaven, but you have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to really prosper and live up to what God wants you to be here on this earth. Amen. If you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward and we want to pray with you right here and help you to receive. Thank you, Jesus. Just come stand right here in front. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Isn't this amazing how many people have received? This is going to change your life. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. A couple of these ladies already been healed today. I already prayed with them. Already been healed. Now you're going to get the Holy Ghost. What a deal. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else?
before you can receive salvation, I mean, excuse me, before you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to receive salvation. The Bible says Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. So is there anyone up here who's not absolutely sure about whether or not you've received Jesus? You know, this woman right here, I prayed with her before and she couldn't walk. Here she is walking. God. She's walking better. I guess she could walk, but she couldn't walk good. She's doing a lot better. Isn't that awesome? Man, you got your healing. Now you're going to get the Holy Ghost. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Man, what a deal. It's so wonderful to get to do this for a living. See people's lives change forever. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody here who's not absolutely sure about whether or not Jesus is your Savior? There's a lot of people that believe Jesus is the Son of God, and they just assume that believing that He exists is enough. But the Bible says in James 2.19, that even the devils believe and tremble at the name of the Lord. You got to do more than what the devil's done. And that is you have to submit your life. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He's already forgiven your sins. He's already dealt with it. It's now a matter of, will you receive it? Will you make Jesus your Lord? It's more than just saying the words. It's a heartfelt thing. You have to believe it. Is there anybody here who's not certain whether or not you've done that? We need to pray with you first and get you to confess Jesus as your Lord and receive salvation before we can pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Anybody here, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand if that's you. You want to make sure. Well, you need to be sure. Anybody else? Here's another one. Anybody else? Are all the rest of you absolutely sure? If you were, here's another one down here. If you were to stand before God right now and he says, why should I let you into heaven? How would you respond? If you start responding by saying, well, I'm a good person and I, I go to church and I'm doing as good as I can, you would go straight to hell. There's going to be all kinds of good people in hell. The only thing that gets you into heaven is the fact that you made Jesus your Lord. You received salvation as a gift. Is there anybody else here? I think there was three. Anybody else? that wants to pray. You got to be sure. I'm not trying to talk you out of your faith. You just got to be sure. And there's so many people that are assuming that's not the right way. Okay. We're going to pray with these three. And I'd like to ask everybody to repeat a prayer with me. And I'm going to say the words that you need to say. It doesn't have to be these exact words, but I'm going to, it needs to be something like what I'm going to say. And if you will say this and mean it from your heart, then you'll be born again. Isn't that good? He's already provided salvation. It's just a matter of you receiving. So let's pray this prayer and have everybody say this. Say, Father, Father I'm sorry for my sin. Sorry for my sins. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive that you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you believe that? Awesome. Awesome. Boy, that's great. I've got a book I'm going to give you that will explain this in more detail. But now, according to the word, every person up here is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says, that when you get born again, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He created you to fill with the Holy Spirit. The reason that's important is because this is what he created you for. He wants it more than you want it. You don't have to beg him to come fill you. Some churches teach that you got to be holy and you got to be clean and pure. And if you have any sin in your life, God won't fill a dirty vessel. God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to fill. Amen. We're all in varying degrees of being less than what we should be. If you have a problem that doesn't disqualify you, it makes you a prime candidate for the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't get holy without the Holy Spirit. So don't let some sense of unworthiness or something make you feel like God wouldn't give it to me. We're just going to ask and believe he wants you to have the Holy Spirit. 
And so we're just going to open up the doors to these temples and let the Holy Spirit come in. And then I'm going to ask our prayer ministers to come up here and stand behind you and lay hands on you because the Bible says that when the apostles laid hands on people, the Holy Spirit came. So we're, all of these people are already filled with the Holy Spirit and they're going to lay hands on you and release this power to flow into your life. So we're going to ask, they're going to lay hands on, and then I want you to quit asking. There's a time to ask, but then there's a time to believe. And I want you to just start thanking him that he gave you the Holy Spirit, like he promised that he would. So we're going to ask, they're going to lay hands on, and then I want you to start thanking him. At that time, I want you to lift your hands like this, because when the, the Bible says, when you lift up your hands, this blesses the Lord. Amen. God likes this. It's like when somebody sticks a gun in your back. You go, surrender. Man, this is your way of surrendering. And I want you to quit asking and start thanking him. And then the Bible says, when you pray in tongues, you are giving thanks. So we are going to start speaking in tongues that God has given us and start praising him that he gave you the Holy Spirit. And as we pray in tongues and speak in tongues, I want you to join in with us. Amen. And just start thanking him in tongues. And I can say a lot. I haven't got time to say more, but I've got a book I'll give you that will explain it. But it's really, it's not hard. But the biggest problem is people think that the Holy Spirit is going to force you to speak in tongues. He doesn't do that. You speak with tongues. Acts 2, 4 says they spoke with tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. He inspires it, but you do the talking. You will feel the desire, but he won't force you to speak in tongues. You have to choose to speak. If you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear the people behind you saying, but your tongue's going to be unique to you. It won't be the same. But once you start talking and you find out it's different, don't quit. Just keep talking. Amen. And anyway, this book will explain it to you. And I promise you, this is going to change your life. I believe you're going to be stronger than horseradish. <laughs> awesome. It's going to change you. Amen. Father, I thank you for all of these. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for these that got born again this morning. And we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we open up the doors of our temple. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come live in us. This is where you are supposed to live. Come and give us your power. We welcome you into our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Now we lay hands on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus. We loose this power and this anointing to flow into you right now. We believe it's burning up all of our carnal attitudes and that Father, your Holy Spirit is just empowering us, giving us revelation knowledge. We loose this power into every one of these now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Now let's put those hands up and go to thanking God. Thank you, Father, that your word's true and that I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for giving me power. Thank him out loud. Talk out loud. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Those of you who know how to pray in tongues, let's start worshiping the Lord, speaking in tongues. And as we speak in tongues, switch from thanking him in English to thanking him in tongues. Whether you feel anything or not is not the important thing. When I received the Holy Spirit, I didn't have a great feeling, but man, I got the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord changed my life. And so just start thanking Him. And you need to speak. Just speak. If you don't know what to say, say what you hear somebody else saying. But your tongue will be different. It'll come out different. Just keep talking. That's it, just speak. You're bypassing your brain. You're praying straight from your spirit. You're bypassing your doubt, your fears, your confusion. You're releasing the Holy Spirit in a way that you've not done before. It's powerful. It may seem strange to you, but man, you are speaking in the tongues of angels. You're releasing power to flow through you. It's powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. 
You know, it looks like just about every person up here is speaking in tongues. Isn't this awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just worship the Lord. Praise God. Isn't this awesome? Let me have your attention here for just a minute. Sorry to interrupt you, but this is more important than what any of you understand. Some of you, this may feel like, well, is this all that there is to it? I tell you, this is one of the most important things. Outside of being born again, this is the most important thing that you could receive from God. But you've got to understand it. And even if you didn't speak in tongues, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit. You just need to learn how to yield and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. When I first prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it took me three and a half years to speak in tongues, but that's because I was a Baptist. <laughs> and I had so much fear and under, misunderstanding about it, it took a long time to get my mind renewed, but I've written everything I know about it in a book and this book has helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people speak in tongues. And I promise you, if you will read this book, it will explain to you about the hang-ups that I had, the fears, and I believe it'll help you to speak in tongues. So it's really important that you get this book because we want you to get the full benefit of what God has done in your life. So right here is Ashley Teradez, the man with his Bible up. If you would go down this aisle, he's going to take you to a room right next door, give you a free book, help you any way you can. If you need healing, they will be there to pray with you. But if you would, just please follow him and we will give you a book and help you to receive. Isn't this awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Boy, I have so many people come up to me and say that they've received the Holy Spirit and that they've just never been the same as a result. To me, this is the number one thing outside of being born again that gets your Christian life going. It's really important. And I tell you, these people are never going to be the same again. I believe it's just going to be a tremendous, tremendous change in their life. Again, we would like to offer our prayer ministers to you. These people are here to help you pray. Uh, I know that there's some people that feel like I'm the only one that can pray for you, but really my anointing is not prayer and miracles. My anointing is to teach the Word of God. And when I pray for you, I do exactly what these people are doing. Matter of fact, some of these people have gift of miracles and gifts of healings that I don't have in my life. And they are well qualified to be able to pray for you. So if you would like prayer, just come forward right now. Let one of our prayer ministers agree with you and lay hands on you. And we're going to believe God for great miracles to happen. The rest of you, if you'd wait just a little bit, I want to give those that want prayer opportunity to get up out of their seat and come forward. Do that right now. And the rest of you, I'll be releasing you. But remember that we have a service tonight at seven o'clock and then we have a service again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and then tomorrow night saturday at six o'clock we start an hour early so that my crew can get everything put up and go to bed before two or three in the morning and then remember that we have cds and dvds already duplicated out there of the two services that we've already had and i tell you they would be a real blessing to you if you can come back and be with us and we're going to have a great time Amen. If you need to be dismissed, you're free to go. Uh, those of you that want to stay and pray, we're going to pray with these. And last night, we had a lot of miracles happen as we were praying here. I called out healings. And uh, you're welcome to stay and pray with us, but you're free to go if you need to. God bless you. Thanks for coming. You are blessed. Blessed will prevent a miracle. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we pray with all of these. We agree with them in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for your healing power. We believe that, Father, you're touching every single person here. Thank you that Jesus has already provided it. By his stripes, we were healed. 
and we just put ourselves in agreement and take our power and authority and we release this supernatural power of God to flow and to heal people right now. Thank you that eyes are opening up. Blind eyes are opening right now. You know, there's people out here that have been struggling with eyesight problems. I believe here's an anointing of God right now that's healing eyes. If that's you, I want you to stand and raise your hand so I can see who's going to receive this. Here's the healing power of God. I've had God heal my eyes. They still aren't perfect, but I was supposed to wear glasses 40 years ago. Had never worn them yet. I believe that this anointing is going to flow towards you and God is opening up eyes. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive supernatural eyesight. Thank you for our eyesight being blessed. Moses was 120 years old, and his natural force wasn't abated or his eyesight dim. So we command our sight not to be dim. For us to see clearly, eyes in the name of Jesus receive this anointing right now. Macular degeneration be gone. Cataracts be gone. Glaucoma be gone off of people now in the name of Jesus. We command stigmatism to be gone in Jesus' name. We command healing to flow through our bodies. Eyes you see clearly. Focus. Focus clearly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Somebody here had an injury to your eye. You've had something hit your eye that damaged it. This is a word of knowledge to quicken your faith. And here's the healing power of God coming unto you. And that eye is being healed right now. Here's this anointing flowing in your body. And Father, we just receive this. Thank you for healing our eyes right now. We receive this in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. I want you to begin to praise God now. Believe that God's healing power is flowing in you and thank Him for your healing. Thank Him that praise God by His stripes you are healed. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. You know, it was 40-something years ago when I was told I had to have glasses and I just prayed in tongues and and was able to read the chart and I got my glass uh, my driver's license without glasses but I still <laughs> had some problems with my left eye so what I began to do the way I got my eyesight to clear up when I was looking into that machine I started praying in tongues and boy it just popped into perfect sight so what I would do I would go to like a restaurant and I'd look across the room at some sign and I'd cover up my right eye, and then I'd look at my left eye, and I'd pray in tongues until it popped into focus again. And when I started, it would take 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and it'd only stay in focus for five minutes or 10 minutes. But I just kept doing that and kept doing it. And you know, then it got to where it took only a minute to get it into perfect focus, and it'd stay there for two weeks or three weeks. I don't know why, I'm just telling you that with me, it wasn't just like an instantaneous thing. I just had to take my authority and go to speaking over me. And here I am 43 years later. And you know what? I still have great eyesight and I can read the small print in my Bible. It's not as perfect as it should be. And I still speak to it, but man, it's working. I'd recommend it. You can get a miracle where it's just instant, or you can just start speaking the word of God over yourself and bless yourself and your eyesight will begin to improve. So I want to encourage you. I believe that God has healed you. You just need to stand in it and walk in that and praise God. You're going to see a difference. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we receive all of these healings. We receive your miraculous power flowing and healing people now in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Somebody here's got some glands right here in your throat. I don't know exactly what glands those are, but you got problems with your throat from glands. Here's a healing power of God touching you. Whoever this is, you know what I'm talking about. 
you've had this diagnosed and here's the healing power of God. Who's this that had problems with glands right here in your throat? I want you to stand and raise your hand so I can see who this is. I know I got the right meeting. Right back here in the back. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Here's one lady back here. Here's a man over here. Here's another one. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release this anointing right now. And whatever's wrong with these glands, I speak healing to them in Jesus' name. Glands, you be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We loose life to flow through you and to reduce the death, the sickness, the disease that Satan has tried to put on these people. Be gone now in Jesus' name. And Father, we receive your perfect health. I thank you that those glands function normally, that they work properly. We agree and we receive this and thank you for doing it in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I believe you're going to see a difference. I believe you're going to see a miracle. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, we just agree and we receive this in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Well, there's people that have been healed, are, are being healed of chest pains. I don't know that that's hard. It could be something else. You could have a hiatal hernia. There's all kinds of problems right here in your chest. But if you've been having chest pains and stuff something. Here's the healing power of God coming unto you. I want you to stand and raise your hand. Amen. Is this you too? Man, you get everything. You just had it all. Man, God's dealing with everything you got. Anybody else here that's been having chest pains, if this is you, I want you to stand and raise your hand. Right here's the lady. Here's another one. Anybody else? Praise God. Here's people back here. Father, we agree and we pray right now and we receive this miracle. Holy Spirit, we loose you right now to heal whatever is causing these chest pains. We command tumors to be gone now in the name of Jesus. Hearts, you be healed, healthy. Hearts, you beat properly in the name of Jesus. Command hiatal hernias to be healed. Father, we loose your power in whatever is causing these chest pains. We believe that the source of it is gone. And now the pain leaves and that we are healed from this time forth in the mighty name of the Lord.